Okay. Okay, so let's get this started. So uh, we really do wrap up the rock field today and move on. Uh, so uh, what kind of the things I mentioned only just by uh, verbally uh, uh, on Wednesday, I actually put them in slides. So you, I, I urge you to look at them. For example, this is a paper that reported the first direct observation of time reversal non-invariance. So we talked about the fact that charge conjugation is not a symmetry because that there is a left-handed neutrino, but no right-handed uh, neutrino. And the parity is also broken because of the same reason. And the time reversal is also broken. So C, P, and T individually are not uh, symmetries of nature uh, as far as I know, but the, their product C times P times T is predicted to be a symmetry uh, uh, in, in Lorentz invariant quantum field theory. So that's a theorem we went uh, but briefly mentioned the last time. So, uh, so that predicts, for example, the energy levels of the hydrogen and anti-hydrogen to be the same. So anyway, so the time reversal violation was reported in this paper in 1998. And so this is the quantity that violates the time reversal because here is a process of this neutral anti k on turning into neutral k on which by itself is a very interesting physical process. But here is this inverse process of neutral K-on going to neutral anti-K-1. And if there's a difference in their probabilities, that means that you can't reverse time because the, the inverse process has a different weight from the process itself. And experimentally, equivalent quantity to measure is this one, where they say that this is supposed to be the same, identical with the time reversal asymmetry given in one. And under this uh, uh, the statement, you can look at this abstract and you see this, this quantity in equation two is measured experimentally and it's non-zero. So that's an evidence that time reversal is not a symmetry of nature. So this is the way we know C, P and T, all of them individually are not symmetries of nature, but the CPT as a product is still a symmetry, and that's consistent with the prediction of the Lorentz invariant quantum field theory. So that's the thing I mentioned just by words uh, on Wednesday, but now you can see this, this uh, the paper in the slides for the Wednesday's lecture. So I, I urge you to look at them. I also mentioned this fact that the nuclear beta decay, the energy of the electron comes with a continuous spectrum, while the usual idea of energy conservation would predict discrete lines, as we know, for the atomic transitions and nuclear transitions. And because they didn't know that there is a new, another particle called neutrino emitted at the same time in nuclear beta decay, so Bohr speculated that maybe the energy conservation is not true in the microscopic physics. But of course, we know now, thanks to Pauli, uh, and that's the letter I mentioned uh, on, also on Wednesday, the dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen. So in this letter, the Pauli speculated this idea that there is a new particle called the neutrino. He actually called this neutron in his letter, but it was later renamed to neutrino by Enrico Fermi, you know, being Italian. So he added this uh, eno at the end of the word, right? So, uh, so that's the name we are stuck with. But anyway, so you see this letter in there as well. So that's how the idea of neutrino came out. And then I mentioned this uh, measurement of the helicity of neutrino in this paper. And I just wanted to also flash the picture of this beautiful experiment, Super Cameo Kanda. And, and what you see here is the water tank, which is still more or less empty, but because they have to actually make this tank incredibly clean to avoid any radioactive contaminants in water. So these poor graduate students are on this uh, rubber shaft and, and, they, uh, uh, and then they actually trying to clean the surface of these huge 20 inch photomultiplayer tubes one by one with the alcohol and cloth, you know, the real manual labor here. And they have to do this in this water tank, this 40 meters wide. So they clean one, go to the next one, the next one, and come all the way back around this uh, tank. And then they fill water to go up one step up. And then, and you have to keep doing this process for something like three months to clean the entire tank because tank itself is this big. You know, it's an incredible tank. And, and uh, two years ago, I actually had a pleasure of getting inside this tank because that was a time when they were actually installing new instruments and, and also do a new cleaning. And so the tank was actually uh, drained. 
and I was invited to actually visit the tank. So I got from this hole up there and, and went on a, uh, a gondola to just keep going down in this tank. And I took the movie of it and it's incredible. So here we start, this is the top layer of the photomolecular tubes. So I'm coming into the tank now and I'm, I have my cell phone. I actually sort of took the movie and, and, and it, so this is the super cameo candy experiment. So I'm pointing my camera downwards and, and see how tall this tank is. And this, so this is the area where, you know, this is a float and people do their work uh, are actually standing on this float uh, as the tank gets drained at this stage. You also see how clear the water is. And so well, this is the ultra pure water, uh, which is clear, clean to the level of the radioactive contaminants less than 10 to minus 12 uh, grams per gram. And that's the kind of purity you need for the purpose of detecting neutrinos because you're fighting against radioactivity background in it. And then I talked about this possibility of Majorana fermion. Now that we discovered that neutrinos have finite mass. So one possible interpretation is that you can actually have the neutrino and the antineutrino to be the same particle. And that is actually represented by this Majorana fermion. So the easiest way to actually understand the Majorana fermion is to go to a new basis where these gamma matrices are all pure imaginary. And, and they still satisfy the same anti-commutation relation to reproduce this uh, initial requirement that the P squared is M squared as no as Dirac required. So the Dirac equation is consistent with the relativistic relationship between energy and momentum that way. And this is another way of writing these matrices, but in this basis, they are all pure imaginary. So that the Dirac equation is pure real. And therefore, if Psi is a solution, then Psi star is also a solution. And in particular, you can impose this additional condition that the Psi is real in this basis. So with this condition, then it's a similar thing as we have done with the Klein-Gordon field. The real Klein-Gordon field has the particle and the antiparticle to be identical particles, even though the Klein complex Klein-Gordon field has a distinction between particle and antiparticle. So in the same way, complex Dirac field, which is the usual Dirac field, has a distinction between particle and antiparticle, just like the electron and positron. But the Majorana fermion uh, has a half the degrees of freedom. You still have spin up and down because it's spin one half particle, but you lose the distinction between particles and antiparticles. So you have only two degrees of freedom instead of four. So that's the idea of Majorana fermion. And you are checking this idea with the one plus one dimensional uh, fermion field in your homework problem, where things are a lot easier because everything is only two by two matrices and two component spinners. So anyway, so in this basis, it turns out that the positive energy spinners U and negative energy spinners V turned out to be just pure complex conjugates to each other. So once you impose this condition as psi is real, then what you end up doing is to changing this D creation operator into the annihilation operator of the particle so that the psi field is now manifestly Hermitian. So the Hermitian conjugate of the first term is nothing but the second term. And that is the way you satisfy this reality condition of the field psi. And then you have this Majorana fermion. So then in this case, you don't have the distinction between a fermion and its anti-fermion counterpart. And that's the idea of Majorana fermion. So the neutrino could well be the Majorana fermion. And we have so far have not seen evidence that there is a fermion which is identical to anti-fermion experimentally, but the theoretically this is what had been suggested. And, and so, uh, 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 so that it will, of course then remains to be seen if we can actually prove this experimentally. But anyway, so that's the story we went through the last time. Any questions about what we discussed? And I might have mentioned to you at some point, so the, Ettore Majorana was a uh, uh, the theoretical physicist in Italy, and he is also sort of mystical figure. And he eventually uh, was on a boat and, and totally disappeared without a trace. 
and there are books written about this mystery on what happened to him. So uh, if you're curious about that, then you can read. Uh, I'm sure you can look up uh, the go, uh, Amazon to find some uh, books written about uh, this Mr. Ettore Majorana. Any further questions about this? Is it okay? So as I said, it, it still remains to be seen if neutrino is really Majorana. And uh, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that when you actually impose this reality condition, just like we did also for the real Klein-Gordon field, you're supposed to put a factor of one half in the action because once psi is real, psi and psi bar are the same thing. And therefore, when you define the canonical conjugate momentum, then you have psi squared in it. So taking derivative with respect to psi, you get a factor of two because of that. So you need to put a factor of one half uh, to compensate for that factor of two. So it's a little de detail, but uh, that this is what you also need to be aware of when you talk about real fields instead of complex fields like Dirac Fermia. Okay, so uh, the question is, how do we prove this? And so the best idea we have is to look for something called a neutrino double beta decay. And you, some of you might have heard about this. So the question is really whether antimatter can turn into matter, right? So that's the idea of Majorana Fermia. So uh, if you have a relatively large-ish nucleus, so in this case, I'm looking at the terurium 130. Uh, it's, it's a big nucleus. Uh, there are 130 uh, the protons and neutrons inside this nucleus. And if you go to sort of biggish nucleus, then the protons, of course, would repel each other. So there's a, a pretty big Coulomb repulsive force in there. And at the same time, there is a tendency in nuclear physics that when you have two neutrons or two protons, they tend to pair up to lower their energies. So if you have nucleus with even number of protons and even number of nu neutrons, which is the case with terurium 130, all the neutrons are paired, all the protons are paired, so that their energy level of the ground state tend to be rather low because of this pairing force. But if you think about this terurium under undergoing a beta decay and terurium turns into iodine in that case, but then you have odd number of protons and odd number of neutrons, so pairing is broken. So it turns out that the energy level of the ground state for 130 uh, iodine is actually higher than that of the terurium. So energetically, terurium cannot decay into iodine. So a single beta decay is forbidden in that case. But if you do yet another beta decay, then iodine turns into xenon, then you again have even number of protons and even number of neutrons. So the ground state here is lowered because of this pairing. So energetically, terurium can decay into xenon by a process called double beta decay. So in that double beta decay, you expect that terurium to emit two electrons because you undergo two beta decays and also two neutrinos in that case. So this is the case of two neutrino double beta decay, and that happens no matter what. So even when neutrino is not my runner particle, two neutrino double beta decay can happen. But in that case, you are losing energy because you have emitted two neutrinos. So if you measure the energy of two electrons emitted in that process, then it is less than the energy difference between terurium and xenon, so you expect a continuous spectrum like this, similarly to the case of single beta decay, which really uh, made the, uh, uh, the needle spore crazy, right? So you expect this, uh, uh, the continuous uh, energy spectrum of the sum of two electron energies. But if the neutrino is actually my runner particle, then from the first beta decay, you produce this anti-neutrino. But anti-neutrino is the same thing as neutrino now, so if the new anti-neutrino turns into a neutrino, then this neutrino can be absorbed by the second neutron. And so the, then the, pro, the neutron turns into proton by emitting an electron, but emitted anti-neutrino is now absorbed. So you are not losing any energy into neutrinos anymore. So this is a process called neutrino-less double beta decay, which is possible only when the neutrino is a Majorana fermion. So once again, if the neutrino and anti-neutrino are distinct particles, 
then this antineutrino from the first beta decay cannot be absorbed by the second neutron. So you end up doing two neutrino double beta decay. That leads to this continuous spectrum of two electrons. But if the neutrino is a Majorana fermion, then there is no distinction between antineutrino and a neutrino. So the emitted antineutrino can be absorbed as a neutrino by the second neutron. So the process is neutrino-less double beta decay. So terrorium nucleus turns into xenon nucleus by emitting two new electrons, but nothing else. Then if you measure the sum of the energies of two electrons, that has to be exactly the same as the difference between the energies of the terrorium ground state to xenon. So then you expect this discrete peak of the two electron energies at the maximum possible energy that corresponds to the energy difference between the initial and the final state. So in addition to this continuous spectrum, which dies off towards the highest energies, you see this little bump at the very end and that's the signal you're looking for. And in practice, this drawing is extremely exaggerated because this little bump is known to be incredibly tiny if it exists at all. So the lifetime of this neutrino less double beta decay in terurium is already known to be longer than 10 to the 24 years. And, and it, it's incredible to think about the fact that we can actually study this you know, age of the universe is of the order of the 10 to the 10th years. It's a 13.8 billion years. We are talking about the lifetime of terrorium nucleus, which is 14 orders of magnitude longer than the age of the universe. But you can study it because, you know, in quantum mechanics, even if the lifetime is 10 to the 24 years, that's an average lifetime. And if you collect 10 to the 24 atoms, then one of them can decay in a year because quantum mechanics is probabilistic. So the idea is that you pick a big detector which has large number of terrorium nuclei in it and watch them for a long period of time and to see if you see this little bump at the end of the energy spectrum for two electrons. And for this purpose, of course, the energy resolution is the key. If energy resolution is bad, then this bump gets smeared out and gets buried inside this big continuous spectrum. So you need to measure the energy very, very precisely so that you can hope to see this bump at the end of this continuous spectrum. And that's what uh, people are doing in our department, that Yuri Kolomensky is one of the, the American leaders of the experiment called Cuore, which is being done in Italy in an underground laboratory called the Grand Sasso. So that's the idea of the neutrino less double beta decay, which may verify this idea that neutrino is a Majorana fermion, and we are not there yet. So that's why people are working hard towards this goal. Any questions about this idea? No? And for some reason, the, the experiments uh, about neutrino are all very beautiful. So this is the picture uh, of the, the quarry detector. So here they are stacking up the uh, crystals of terrorium oxide and, and they put them in bolometers so that they can measure the energies uh, of emitted electrons very, very precisely by a tiny rise in temperatures. And so, uh, so this is already many kilograms of tellurium so that you can have you know, much larger than 10 to the 24 uh, nuclei in them. So by observing them very carefully, monitoring over a long, a, long, a long time period, and they're looking for this little bump at the end of the continuous spectrum, which would correspond to neutral less double beta decay. And that's the experiment that is ongoing. So they have the best limit on this uh, neutron of beta decay on terrorium uh, uh, the nucleus. There are other experiments going on using other nuclei. <clears throat> In Japan, there's a Kamlan Zen experiment looking for the Xeno-136. There's also another experiment called EXO in the United States, also looking for the double beta decay of Xeno-136. So it's a big competition actually going on worldwide these days, because now that we know the mass, a neutron has a mass, 
it, it's quite possible that it is indeed a myelogranin fermion. And if you do observe this neutron itself with decay, that's the first time we have ever seen that a particle can turn into anti-particle for a fermion, which we have never seen before in experimental physics. So that would definitely be Nobel Prize worthy uh, discovery. So that's the experiment that is being done worldwide in a big competition these days. Okay, any questions about that? <clears throat> Seven, okay? All right. So the, the stake is high about this uh, possibility that uh, the particle, the matter particle, can turn into antimatter particle and vice versa. And that's because we know the universe started with the Big Bang and our own George Smoot took a picture of the Big Bang. So we know that the universe was indeed hot at the very beginning. And when the universe started at hot, the energy turns into matter and antimatter. And as we talked about already, when energy turns into matter, it always creates the matter and antimatter one-to-one. -one. And therefore the universe should have started with the matter and antimatter one-to-one. -one. But if it stayed that way, they eventually, of course, universe expands and cools and matter and antimatter would meet again. And then they disappear one to one and the, the universe would have been empty. So you wouldn't be here today listening to my lecture. So your existence is at stake. So the idea is that, you know, something must have happened on its way. So after Big Bang created equal amount of matter and antimatter, we need a process to reshuffle them, to create imbalance between the amount of matter and antimatter somehow. So that's where we really need a process of reshuffling matter and antimatter. Namely, you need to grab a little part of the, uh, the antimatter and turn them into matter to create imbalance, or it's called asymmetry between matter and antimatter. The only then we can survive the big bang, right? But it looks unlikely that matter and antimatter particles can turn into each other because they have opposite electrical charges. Electron has negative charge, antimatter positron have a positive charge. Proton has a positive charge, antiproton has a negative charge. So charged product particles can never turn for matter and antimatter because of the charge conservation. And the only elementary matter particle we know is actually neutrino with charge zero, and therefore anti-neutron has charge negative zero, which is zero. So it's only neutrinos which have a chance of turning the matter particle into antimatter particle and vice versa. So hence came the theory that perhaps neutrinos and antineutrinos turn into each other at the early stage of the universe to create this asymmetry so that we could survive. So that's the idea put forward by uh, two gentlemen named Yanagira and Fukugira, who used to be my colleagues in Japan. And, and so that's the idea called leptogenesis because the neutrino is a part of the particle families called leptons, which include electron, muon, and tau as well. So the idea is that leptons, namely neutrinos, created, namely genesis, the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And that's how we end up surviving the Big Bang. So if that's true, so the beginning of the universe did have the same amount of matter and antimatter. And here I wrote down 1 billion N1. And it could have been the neutrino which picked up one part of the billion antimatter and turned that into matter. Then now you see an asymmetry between them, two out of a billion, and billion of them disappeared and two remained, and that's you. So that's the idea of leptogenesis. So that's why it stakes are very high uh, to observe this potential uh, <coughs> uh, process of the neutrino turning into anti-neutrino or anti-neutrino turning into neutrino, because at the end of the day, this may have to do with the question why we exist at all in the universe today. So, so that's why the stakes are very high to observe this process of the neutrino double beta decay. And, and so uh, I, whenever I give a public lecture about this, I show this picture that the neutrinos are superheroes. Okay, so, so that's the end of my discussion about Marwara neutrinos. Any questions about that?
Everything okay? All right. You know, I spent a fair amount of time actually making this <laughs> to, to erase I from this and put new in there. <laughs> okay, so the last thing about Dirac equation. So we can also put Dirac equation in the external electromagnetic field. And what you're supposed to do is something you are already familiar with. Namely that here we have the Lagrangian density for Dirac field. Now we are back to the rock field. I'm talking about the electron now. It's no longer my runner. So it has electric charge. And all you have to do is to couple the Dirac field to the electromagnetism is to change this derivative and promote it to covariant derivative. And that's the idea we already used many times in discussing non relativistic Schrodinger field. And then now we also do this for the relativistic Dirac field. So we know exactly how the vector potential and also scalar potential, that's the time component of this four dimensional vector A mu, coupled to Dirac field. So in particular, when you are thinking about the hydrogen like atom, you have the Coulomb potential and Coulomb potential is the scalar potential, which is a time component of A mu. So we just need to put in A zero carefully into this Dirac <coughs> Lagrangian. So here's the equation now. So instead of just del naught, I have this minus E A naught to make it a covariant derivative in the time direction. And of course, if you remember this notation of the time derivative, uh, in order to treat a, a space and time on equal footing, that this zeroth derivative is time derivative times one over C to make sure that it has a dimension of one over the length to be consistent with the other spatial components of derivatives. And the A naught is the scalar potential over C, again, to keep the dimensions in check. So what you're supposed to put in here uh, in A naught, E A naught, is the Coulomb potential over C. So that's the equation you are supposed to solve. So the rest of the problem is the math problem, how to solve this differential equation and find the stationary solutions with the eigenvalues of the energies and that's the problem it is solved in the lecture notes. And so you are welcome to actually look at that. I'm not gonna do this on slides because there's just the technical details about it, but conceptually you can see that it's a very simple thing to do, just like what we used to do in the non uh, 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 the hydrogen atom and out comes the energy uh, eigenvalues. So what you see here is the energy eigenvalues for the principal quantum number N and total angular momentum J, and J is the total angular momentum. So it is the, the uh, ad, after adding the orbital angular momentum L and spin one half. So J is a half odd numbers, ranging for one half and three halves and so on. And because of the rotational invariance of the system, uh, the energy doesn't depend on the magnetic quantum number M for obvious reasons. But in order to build the same J, you have two possibilities of L, right? So if you're talking about J of three halves, it could be that you are adding L01, that's a P wave, and spin one half to build the total angular momentum three halves. Or you can start with L equal two, that's a D wave, and add spin one half to get J equal three halves. So there are two possibilities. That's why you're still keeping L <coughs> as another label to specify the state. <clears throat> so that's the idea. And here are the energy levels. It looks a little complicated and depends on, of course, alpha, that's a fine structure constant, which is the E squared of four by epsilon naught H bar C. <clears throat> that's a dimensionless quantity, one over 137. And if the nucleus has the atomic number Z, of course, it's multiplied by Z. <clears throat> so this <clears throat> doesn't look like a familiar expression to you. <clears throat> But if you do a Taylor expansion of this uh, uh, expression in power series in, in Z alpha, then you start seeing something a lot more familiar. So one is the rest energy of the electron. We are doing relativity. So the rest mass counts towards the energy of the electron. So MC squared is in there, which is of course, as you expect. And then comes the second term at order alpha squared that is the binding energy of the hydrogen atom you are familiar with. 
So I told you some time ago, the simple way of writing the uh, binding energy of the hydrogen atom is mc squared times alpha squared over 2n squared. That's exactly the expression you get. So if you do a power series expansion in z alpha, then you do recover the familiar expression for the binding energy of the hydrogen atom. And that's sort of expected because it turns out that the average velocity of the electron inside the hydrogen atom is z alpha over n. So z alpha over n is basically beta, namely v over c inside the hydrogen atom. So this is the power series expansion in v over c squared. And the typical hydrogen atom binding energy you're looking at is of course order v squared because you're using the kinetic energy half mv squared or p squared over 2m to work out the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. So the binding energy is expected indeed to be order velocity squared. And so the fact that this is order alpha squared is indeed the, the evidence that you're looking at the velocity squared piece in the expansion. And if you go to higher orders, you have find a piece that's order alpha to the fourth. And that's of course then correspond to V over C to the fourth power. So that's the relativistic correction to the non-relativistic energy levels. And you might have seen some discussions on relativistic correction in a, in a quantum mechanics class. The first term goes like P to the fourth over eight M to the M, M, M cube. And that's part of this expression. The other part is the spin orbit coupling, L dot S. That's another piece that comes from the relativistic correction. That's because when the electron is moving inside the hydrogen atom, then it sees the electric field coming from the Coulomb potential, but now it's moving. So you do a slight Lorentz boost of the electric field. So it would appear as the magnetic field because of the Lorentz boost. And the magnetic field, of course, couples the spin magnetic moment. And that's how the spin orbit coupling arises. And it's a little complicated because that's not an inertial frame, it's an accelerating frame. So there's a correction due to that fact called Thomas uh, factor. Uh, but anyway, so that's how you can understand the origin of spin orbit coupling. That's yet another piece coming into this expression. And there's yet another piece called Darwin term. Again, if you look at the lecture notes, you see the discussions of this by taking non relativistic approximation in a systematic expansion V over C from the Dirac equation for tiny 4D Wolthausen transformation. So that's how you can understand this alpha to the fourth piece. But of course, you can also have additional corrections at higher orders in Z alpha. So this first line contains all of these power series expression in Z alpha in a single expression. So this is the old order result in the power series expansion in Z alpha, if you like. And it's also manifestly the case that it terms only on J. So even though J of, I said, three halves can be constructed from L equal one or L equal two, because the expression depends only on J, those two states are supposed to be exactly degenerate to each other. And that's the energy levels I'm gonna show on the next slide. <coughs> but anyway, I hope conceptually everything is clear. So this is the energy level of the hydrogen atoms for the Dirac equation, not Schrodinger equation, which gives you the prediction on the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, including all of these relativistic effects at arbitrary high orders in expansion in V over C. Okay, any questions about this? Uh, I might have missed it or maybe, uh, but are we just uh, like, we don't have uh, spatial components of the vector potential here? Is that just because right. we're only considering? A, yes, like, uh, here Coulomb we're only potential. considering the Coulomb potential. That's right. That's okay. why I have this uh, time component of the four vector potential but not spatial component of the vector potential, just because I haven't applied the magnetic field to the system. Okay. So if you want to apply, for example, magnetic field or hydrogen atom and study Zeeman effect, then obviously you need to put in vector potential, but you know exactly what to do by replacing the spatial derivative in a way that forms a combination of P minus EA in a non relativistic language. So here, H bar over I del I should come together with minus EAI. 
So replacing this derivative del mu in a Lorentz covariant fashion to del mu minus a mu. So this covariant derivative take care, takes care of both the, sc the scalar potential, namely Coulomb potential and the vector potential in a unified manner. So you know exactly what uh, equation you're supposed to be looking at. And then you can go ahead and try to solve that. Okay. Thanks for asking the question. Any other questions here? Okay, good. So then the prediction is the following. So you have these uh, usual levels of hydrogen atom. And if you're looking at the S states, then L is zero. And by adding spin of one half, the total J can only be one half. So for S states, the total J is always one half. And this is a spectroscopic symbol. You put J as a subscript uh, 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 next to the, uh, uh, the, the, the name of the orbital. But for P states, L is, L is one. So if you put the spin one half in addition to it, then you can have two possible values of J, one minus one half, that's one half, and one plus one half, that's three halves. And the prediction from the Dirac equation is that S one half and P one half shares the same principal quantum number N, N is common, shares the same total angular momentum J, J is common, and therefore they need to be exactly degenerate to each other. They are different states, but they are degenerate. And of course, in a non relativistic case, all orbitals with the same n were degenerate, and they are now split because of the relativistic correction and spin orbit coupling, but the splitting would still maintain the degeneracy between S one half and P one half. In the same way, when you go to N equal three, you have S, P and D orbitals and the P will split into one half and three halves again, and three S one half and three P one half are supposed to be degenerate. But now the D orbital will split into J equals three halves and five halves, and three D three halves is still supposed to be degenerate with three P three halves, and so on and so forth. So that's the prediction of the Dirac equation uh, on, the, on the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. So this is already a very important prediction of the relativistic field theory that you would predict the exact degeneracy between S and P if J is, the, is, the, is common between the two states and same with P and D, D and F and so on and so forth. Okay, any questions about this? Everything clear? Okay. Then we move into the final subject of, of this course. Namely, we try to put everything together. And that's the theory called quantum electrodynamics, and which is dubbed QED. And, and QED, of course, is something you use at the end of the proof of mathematical theorem. When a theorem is proven, then you put down QED. I forgot what it stands for in Latin. Uh, so I'm not good at Latin, obviously. So I don't know what it stands for, but the QED means end of the proof, right? So the, uh, the, I think this shows the confidence of people how successful the quantum electrodynamics is when you put all of these ingredients together, which is actually a very simple conceptual idea. So here is it, here, this is it. So you now have Lorentz invariant QFT. We know how you describe the photon using Maxwell field, and we know the Lagrangian for it. We did quantize its Lagrangian and found that indeed it's a description of the photon with the two polarizations. We talked about this already. So that's the theory for the free photon. We also just finished up discussion on the free Dirac field. And in Dirac field is spin one half, has mass M. Then you know the Lagrangian for it. We quantized it and obtained four degrees of freedom of helicity plus and minus for the electron and helicity plus and minus for the positron. So we know this already uh, uh, for cool. So we know the Lagrangian for the spin one photon. We know the Lagrangian for spin one half electron. And now we put them together. And as we just talked about in the case of the hydrogen atom, we know exactly what we are supposed to do. In order to come up with a gauge invariant theory of the electromagnetism, all you need to do is replace this derivative acting on the Dirac field 
by the covariant derivative, which includes this four vector potential. And that's it. That's the quantum electrodynamics. So you have seen all these ingredients already. And so you know what they are. And the only thing you need to do now is to replace this derivative by covariant derivative. And now you know the Lagrangian for quantum electromagnetism. Namely, you have this term, F mu nu, F mu nu, as a kinetic term for the photon Maxwell field. And then you have this Lagrangian for Dirac field with the only difference being this del mu replaced by this covariant derivative, and that's it. And we know already what you're supposed to do with this original f mu nu, f mu nu, you quantize it. You have also quantized this Dirac field. So the only new term you have in Lagrangian is this E a mu part stuck in the Dirac Lagrangian. And then we can develop perturbation theory with it. So we have the free Lagrangian for f mu nu, f mu nu. You have the free Lagrangian for Dirac field, and that's the zeroth order Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. You go to interaction picture so that the field operators evolve according to this zeroth order Hamiltonian. Then you have the interaction of Hamiltonian coming from A mu stuck in here between psi bar and psi. That's this VI here. And then we know how the uh, time dependent perturbation theory works. We have this new time evolution operator UI given in terms of this time order product of the exponential of this inter interaction Hamiltonian. So we have seen all of these ingredients already and all we need to do then is put them together. And when you put them together, it turns out that we see emergence of something called Feynman diagrams where you can describe all kinds of processes in terms of graphical representation of drawing lines and, 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 and understand the processes very visually. And, and the diagrams are not just a visual representation, but they mean something very specific. Once you draw the diagram, then that would allow you to really write down the quantum mechanical amplitudes, which you would eventually put into Fermi's golden rule and compute the decay rates cross sections and so and so forth. So that's the idea. Now we are trying to put everything together. So before doing so, any questions about this idea, how you put everything together in a single framework? No questions? You guys are quiet today. Sure? Okay. So here's this idea. So this is the full Lagrangian now. You have the piece for the Maxwell field. So the first time describes the free theory of massless photons. And in this Lagrangian, you have this covariant derivative now. So if you remove this a, a, mu, a, 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 e, a mu, that's the Lagrangian for the free drag field. And you know exactly what it does. That gives you the theory of a spin one half electron and positron. So you split this Lagrangian into two pieces. So the first piece is a zeroth order action, which describes a free photon and free electron and positron, right? So you know exactly what this is. The only additional term is the piece where you have this E a mu as a part of the covariant derivative. So here is the term. So it's a very simple theory. You have unperturbed theory, which corresponds to free spin one photon and free spin one half electron and positron. Then you have this interaction term. And you also know what this interaction term does because in the interaction picture, the psi follows the free Euler Lagrange equation. F mu nu follows free Maxwell's equation. So you can do the motor expansion as we have done already many times. In the motor expansion, a mu is expanded in terms of the polarization vector and creationization operator for the photon. Psi Dirac field is expanded using positive energy solutions and negative energy solutions. And positive energy solutions comes with the annihilation operator for the electron and creation operator for the positron. 
that's the discussion we just finished like a, uh, a 10 minutes ago. And to avoid the clash of notation, I changed the symbol of annihilation operator of the electron to B instead of A, because I'm using A for the photon. So I hope that doesn't cause any confusion here. So we know what Psi does. The Psi is a field operator that can annihilate an electron or create a positron. And Psi, dar, psi bar is the Hermitian conjugate of that. So in, instead of the annihilation operator of the electron, we have now the creation operator for the electron. And instead of the creation operator for the positron, we have the annihilation operator for the positron. So we know exactly what this interaction Hamiltonian does, which has eight pieces now, because A mu contains two pieces, annihilation and creation of photon. Psi bar contains two pieces, creation of electron and annihilation of a positron. Psi contains two pieces, annihilation of electron and creation of positron. So two times two times two are eight possibilities so that we look at one by one. So any questions about this? I think looking at the next slide will make it much clearer anyway. So now we only look at this interaction part because we know this free part uh, does. So we only look at this piece here and then we look at the individual pieces. So I'm gonna use yellow color for vector potential A mu, cyan for psi bar and magenta for psi. And now we can start drawing diagrams. And because we follow Dirac's notation, that initial state is a ket on the right and the final state is a bra on the left. We have to follow time evolving towards the left, which is kind of unusual and blame Dirac for that. Maybe, you know, if you're familiar with Arabic or Hebrew, that may be natural to you, right? Because you write from right to left. So that's the convention we're gonna use on this slide. So what this, uh, the uh, operator does is then very clear. So if you have electron in the initial state, this Psi would annihilate it. There's an annihilation operator for the electron. And Psi bar can create an electron because you've got B dagger in it. And at the same time, it can also create a photon because you have A dagger as a part of this uh, A mu operator. So one thing this operator can do is to create this process that electron comes in, electron goes out by emitting a photon. And that's something we know electromagnetism does. E electron can emit a electromagnetic wave in classical electromagnetism. So in quantum electrodynamics, it emits a photon instead of creating electromagnetic wave. So electron can emit a photon. So that's one thing this operator can do but can do several other things as we talked about because there are eight possibilities of looking at all combinations. So instead of using A dagger, I can use A, an annihilation operator of the photon. Then you're looking at a process that you have both electron and photon in initial state and photon is now absorbed by the electron. That's the second possibility. Now there are six more. Another thing is that Psi has a creation operator of positron in it. So Psi can create a positron. And then Psi bar can annihilate a positron. At the same time, A can create a photon or again, annihilate a photon. So you have an interaction of a positron with a photon, which of course you would expect. Positron is also a charged particle. So it would interact, emit or absorb a photon. But there are four more possibilities. You can have electron that gets annihilated by this annihilation operator in Psi in magenta, but then Psi bar can annihilate a positron. So that would lead to annihilation of electron and positron, which can lead to the creation of the photon. So now you have a new possibility. Matter and antimatter can indeed annihilate electron and positron can annihilate to produce a photon. And that's the process we never discussed so far, right? But you do expect that process to happen now that there's matter and antimatter as we talked about in terms of why we exist in the universe today. 
So this process indeed does happen. At the same time, you can also use annihilation operator of the photon. So you have something that looks kind of exotic. Electron and positron together with photon can all annihilate to the vacuum. So this kind of process exists too. And you might complain, this doesn't seem to conserve energy. But as we talked about in the second order in time-dependent perturbation theory, you can go through an intermediate state where energy conservation is apparently violated. But as long as the real initial state and real final states have the same energies, you can go through intermediate states with apparent energy violation allowed within a certain principle. So even though this process by itself doesn't conserve energy, it could be part of the process so that it can actually be used as a part of the process. And finally, if matter and antimatter can annihilate, it can be also created in pair. So here I'm using psi as a creation operator for the positron, psi bar as a creation operator of the electron, together with creation operator of the photon, or also with the annihilation operator of the photon. So we can use perturbation theory by gluing together these eight possible, what we call vertices, where three lines meet at some space-time point. And we keep using these eight possible vertices to come up with physical processes you want to study. So that's the beginning of this idea called Feynman diagrams. So now time is up, but let me just flash you one possibility of how to use this. And I'm also drawing lines. I'm gonna actually explain this once again uh, uh, and next time. So it's convenient to use these arrows to keep track of which, what, what is particle and what is antiparticle. I'm not gonna explain it today, but here's an example of how you actually use it. If you're trying to co compute the process of electron proton scattering, which is the example like Rutherford scattering, which you have seen in non dualistic quantum mechanics, you use these vertices and because the perturbation theory goes with the time uh, ordering, you have these two time orderings of one emitting a photon, one absorbing a photon. But this is the only diagrams you have. And putting these two time orderings together, we call, we define something called the propagator of the photon. And you know, every term in this operator, when you add an electron, you use that is accompanied by the positive energy solution. When you create an electron, that's accompanied again by positive energy solution of electron, same with the proton. So you know what these positive energy solutions are. And in between, you are sandwiching this gamma matrix, and this is part of the vertex. Then gluing these photon lines together, you have this propagator. So this quantum mechanical expression of the quantum amplitude going from initial state to final state using this time-dependent perturbation theory means something very, very specific. You are using these positive energy solutions together with this E gamma mu in between. You use positive energy solutions for initial and final state proton. You are putting this E gamma mu in between and the photon goes from here to there, which is represented by this, what is called the propagator. And this is the result. This is how you compute quantum mechanical amplitude. All you have to do is stick in positive energy solution we worked out last week, and then you know what the amplitude is in quantum electrodynamics. So that's how quantum uh, electrodynamics works using these Feynman diagrams. So these diagrams are kind of intuitive and easy to draw, but it means something very, very specific once you have a diagram, you can immediately write down what the quantum amplitude is for this process. So that's how we use these diagrams to compute quantum processes in quantum electrodynamics. So next, next week we don't have classes. So after Thanksgiving, we go back and talk once again about this, how to use these operators using these different processes involved in it. So these are what is called individual vertices and then we glue them together, as you saw, to start computing uh, specific processes, at least the simple ones, 
so that you know what these Feynman diagrams actually do and give you a practical way of computing quantum mechanical amplitudes with them. Okay, so let me finish here for today. Any questions about that? Okay, so we repeat this discussion. So if you have any questions today, uh, you have an opportunity to ask them again after Thanksgiving. And sorry, I went over time by five minutes, but let me finish here. Okay, so uh, that's the end today. So have ha happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, you too.